give a warm welcome to Michael Stahl David. When I was in high school, I was into two things, uh, graffiti and radical leftist politics. Uh, my freshman year, I organized a Marxist study group, and I spent hours like arguing with my friends that human nature wasn't inherently greedy, and that there was a more egalitarian way to organize society. And I wanted to end war, I wanted to end racism and sexism, but I also like, really wanted to be thought of as cool. I uh, was kind of a nerd in, in all through grammar school, and I was determined to go to high school with like a different image. And uh, the twisting, intricate letters of graffiti were my way of rebranding myself. So I was no longer the, the kid with the yellow sweatpants who was obsessed with computer programming and chess. When I, you know, like Clark Kent, switching the glasses for his cape, when I would throw on my backpack full of spray paint and head out, I was in my alter ego. I was Kami. <laughs> and uh, around this time in Chicago where I grew up, um, all the walls alongside the elevated tracks that had been covered in graffiti throughout my whole childhood were buffed brown, every wall brown. So there was this blank canvas, and I got out there. Kami, Kami, <laughs> big colorful letters, FB, that was my crew, fight back. <laughs> for beauty, you know, I thought it was this is rallying cry for the vague, oppressed people and, uh, you know, free art for tired commuters. <laughs> And that first summer, I remember I, I, I rocked five rooftops on this two-mile stretch of the red line. And, you know, seeing my stuff up there in like teal, navy letters, and the force field and silver to make it pop. And I remember literally skateboarding home after one of these successful missions and literally yelling out loud, I'm rocking shit! <laughs> uh, so, and you know, I was also, and, and I started getting the, the recognition I wanted. The kids were like, hey, damn, Kami, you've been getting up, you know? But it was never enough. Like, I always wanted more. And I also fell in love with the adventure of it. I, as a graffiti writer, I experienced a side of the city that no one else got to see. I got to run through the subway tunnels, and uh, I had a key to the conductor's booth of the L train. And I would, like, take girls in there to make out. And then I would open the conductor's window and, like, tag on the moving train. And everywhere, Kami, fight back. And sometimes like little tags, sometimes big, intricate, colorful letters, but I, I wasn't really passionate about visual art. I, I, I didn't draw outside of that. I never wanted to make a career out of it. And I, so I always thought of it as temporary. And by the time I got to my senior year, I knew I had to quit. I mean, I, I'd gotten busted a bunch of times, been arrested like 10 times. Always like misdemeanors, you know, community service. Also like strained my relationship with my parents to the brink, and then my grades were crap. And so, Luckily, uh, I always thought when I get to college, I'll start over. And luckily, uh, I had some people who had uh, taken me under their wing in terms of acting, and I was getting a chance to go to start college in Chicago in a great acting program. So that summer, before, a couple weeks before I started college, I decided to take a trip to San Francisco. I had met this uh, older actor who lived there so I could crash with him, and so I invited my, my best comrade of the can, my boy Ian, to come with me. Ian uh, was black, he wrote Eon, and uh, his mom was a waitress. And we show up in San Francisco, and our minds are blown. I mean, we're coming from Chicago where, like I said, brown walls, they, sometimes you paint a piece, and then the next morning you'd be gone. San Francisco, it was like everywhere. And we were just like kids in a candy store. We were like, oh, shit, this is crazy. So, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a bunch of graffiti, and then one night, we're drunk, it's after a party, we're really reckless that night. I remember like tagging in front of a Starbucks, I remember like climbing on top of a moving truck to like get really high up on some stuff. I was, you know, wilding out. And sure enough, we see this un unmarked cop car like flip a U-turn. I, I drop the can, kick it to the street real smooth, and they pull up on us, see our hands covered in paint. We start this whole story about how we're art students, we just came from the studio, blah, blah, blah. They're not buying it. Then they bring a witness in the back of the squad car, they have a stand in the street, and they shine a spotlight on us. This woman IDs us. And uh, we still, we remain like, no, 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 no. Like, we keep denying it, denying it. So they charge us with conspiracy. And then they charge us with, because they knew we'd hit a bunch of spots, felony charges for uh, destruction of property. That was my first felony. So we're taken into lockup, not like a regular precinct lockup, like downtown real lockup. Ian and I are separated. And I spend, like, my first night in this 5 by 10 cell full of, like, 
tough older like guys, you know, including a guy who told me that he robbed a, a taxi with a shotgun. <laughs> and I just like didn't make conversation after that. And uh, I scrolled into a ball and tried to remain invisible. I just issued a, a jumpsuit, did the full bed over and cough thing. Finally, the next morning, I got a phone call and uh, I went to call my parents' house, you know, my home line. And even like hearing the tone, that tone of your phone number, you know, is like, you know, giving me some hope. And, you know, even though I was ashamed to call and say, like, well, yeah, I really did it this time, I also knew my mom loved me no matter what. And I was eager to hear her voice. And instead, I just heard, I'm sorry, this number no longer accepts collect calls. And I was like, oh, Jesus. So then I uh, got I issued a cell, and then days started passing. And um, I didn't know how long I was to be there. I didn't know when I was going to get in front of a judge, and when I did, I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, these were felony charges. I was maybe going to do some time. Either way, I was probably going to miss the start of college. I just spent that first day just staring out the window at the, at the cars like on the highway, it just my guts just churning with anxiety. I woke us up at 5 a.m. for breakfast, and uh, I saw Ian at another table, and I went over to him. And he said that our moms had been in touch, and that they weren't going to get us lawyers or anything. We were on our own. Later that day, I was in a common area, and I saw Ian sitting with some other black guys playing dominoes, and so I like went over, sat down, and this dude was like, the other dude was like, get the fuck out of here, honky. And I looked at Ian, and he just looked away. And I knew I was like, yeah, okay, I'm on my own. And then the next day, the cops who arrested us showed up again. The detectives took me into a utility closet. I still hadn't confessed anything. They said, listen, if you uh, cooperate with us, we'll go easy on you. And they pull out this envelope with photos. They start showing me photos. And I see come, I see my tag, drunken, kind of sloppy, on side of this apartment building, and it looks so stupid. It wasn't beautiful, it certainly wasn't political, it was just me writing my name on someone else's shit. And I was like, yeah, I'm Kami, that's me. So, that night, I just... Went back to myself, feeling like such an asshole. I mean, I, I always thought I would, I would uh, get through the graffiti phase with some good stories, but I come out the other side, you know, without any major harm done. Now, now I had done. I had screwed my life up. I wasn't starting college. Instead, I was in jail. I was have a felony on my record, and I just felt like the biggest asshole. In the morning, I wake up at the start. Someone's like, "Hey, man, wake up! They just bombed the World Trade Center." I was like, "What?" And, of course, we don't have any news or anything, so there's just rumors going through the, through the, through the cell block. 50,000 people killed, 60,000 people killed. Finally, someone's like, guard, hold up, hold up the newspaper so we can see. This guard, like, holds up the front page of the paper. And we, that's the first time I saw the smoke of towers. And I just thought immediately, like, oh, we're going to war, for sure. What, is it going to be a draft? I mean, is there going to be World War III? What's this going to be? It's terrified. And, uh, <coughs> I went to brush my teeth, and this song came into my head that I hadn't thought of since I was a child. It was a, a lullaby that my mom used to sing to me before bed. And I started like humming it to myself, and just started crying like into my toothbrush, trying to like hide it in the toothbrush while I cried. I go back to the cell block, and there's all this commotion. They're calling people's names. They, I hear my name. Stall, David, roll up! Roll up your bedding. Like You're being moved. So I roll up my bedding, I go up to this room, and I'm just waiting in this, in this processing room. And this is a room unlike any other room I've been in in jail, because people are like happy, they're like chatting. This one guy's like, man, as soon as I get home, I'm gonna roll me a big honey blunt. I was like, you can do that? I was just like, what's going on? And that's when I realized like, we were getting let go. I guess like anybody who was non-violent offenders who was there, was just getting let go. I guess maybe uh, because the San Francisco's on the coast, no one knew what was gonna happen. Next thing I know, I'm just getting issued my civilian clothes, and I walk out of the jail, out into the street, like skipping literally into the, into the freedom. And I go back to the house of the guy who lived there, and uh, he's from New York, so when I see his face, it dawns on me that this was literally like the most terrifying day for like everybody else, and uh, that the world had changed. And I, a couple days later, 
get on a flight back to Chicago. I start college, and I never hear anything about the charges again. Somehow, crazily, I had gotten another chance, and I wasn't going to screw it up. Thanks. Mm -hmm.